Honorable Speaker, Fair House of Representatives, Honorable Femba Jabi, I'm like the pleasure of having you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thank you so much. Interestingly, it's over now two years since uh, the National Assembly was inaugurated for this ninth assembly. In your inaugural speech on the 11th of June 2019, you said, the ninth assembly under my leadership is going to be a house of reforms, or if you like, a reform assembly. The reforms will be dished out piecemeal and at intervals so as not to shock the system. Let me ask you, can you boldly say that that has been the story in the last two years? And what sort of reforms can you spe specifically lay claims to? Well, thank you, uh, Shil. First of all, um, let me just put this um, on the record. You and I both know that um, um, reforms are not something you achieve easily. Uh, that statement was made deliberately. The words were chosen very carefully. It was a bold and audacious statement, being mindful of the fact that reforms anywhere in the world don't come easy when you try to change a system that's been set in and baked into the system. Uh, but we have done, um, uh, we have achieved major milestones in terms of reform. Uh, reform can be a very nebulous word. It depends on how you look at it. But if you want to dissect it, the Ninth Assembly um, hit the ground running. Um, there have been several reforms uh, uh, that touch on almost everything. First of all, the harmonious relationship between members. Uh, much as we all become, belong to different parties, uh, we have deliberately tried to blur the party lines for one reason and one reason alone, having the national interest, the national interest at the, uh, at the foremost in our mind, at the forefront of our, of our, of our thinking. And that's why we, ta uh, we tagged uh, the Ninth Assembly, the Nation Building Joint Task. That in itself was a reform, uh, working together. You know, when people talk about a harmonious relationship, they normally talk about the executive and legislative relationship, the, 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 the vertical uh, uh, relationship between the executive and the legislature. They don't talk about the relationship between the parties within the legislature. Uh, but that has, that, has, um, that has so far worked well for, for the country. Uh, we've been able to achieve much working together. Um, we're about to go into another election cycle. I don't know what's going what's to happen you know, moving forward, if that's going to endure, hopefully it will endure, but I will expect, you know, a little bit of uh, politics will come to play. In terms of the relationship between the executive and the legislative uh, branches of government, and that in itself, the relationship itself, uh, is, it's, it's, it's harmonious as it is also playing its role of checks and balances. And that little bit of harmony that we've put in has also helped us in achieving landmark legislation. Uh, that both sides have cooperated that inure to the benefit of Nigerians. And that's the key, that's, that's what's important. The things that we have done in working together with the uh, executive, whilst also mindful of our roles as a legislator in terms of checks and balances, those things have been able to achieve results for, for, the, common, um, for the common man in Nigeria. Uh, talk about e-parliament. That was a reform that was meant to shake the system. We're not completely there yet. But we're, we're getting there, the, the, the equipment is there. Um, in terms of voting for where, uh, important legislations where everybody needs to, so to speak, answer his father's name, we're almost there. It's a system itself that, is, uh, that we're trying to work out the, 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 the nicks and put, in, and put in place. The issue of parliamentary diplomacy, it's a, something that we innovated, we brought into play in, uh, in this ninth assembly. Uh, we've achieved results in Ghana. We've achieved results in South Africa. We've achieved results even in China uh, during the COVID crisis, where, they, they, where again, the, the legislature steps in, uh, but maybe a little bit beyond its traditional role uh, as, as, as legislators, but to work um, uh, in sync with the executive uh, in achieving results where, you know, they say putting all hands on deck, and I'll use um, I'll give the Ghana anecdote where we had problems in, uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, Niger with, our, uh, with our Nigerians that live and reside in Ghana in terms of their treatment, economic, and all of that. And we went as a parliament. Uh, it was, you can call it backdoor diplomacy, but we call it parliamentary diplomacy. And we spoke to the, I met with the, with the Speaker of Ghana at the, at the time. 
and um, we were able to achieve re with the results. I went to, uh, with him to see the, 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 the president of Ghana, and um, that relationship, uh, even though it's not perfect yet, but it's still, you know, it has been smoothing, the, you know, the cracks have been smoothing. We did it in South Africa, we did it in, uh, uh, in, to a lesser extent in, 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 um, in China. And um, so many other things, talking about the January to December uh, cycle, uh, budget cycle, which we brought back to what it was originally supposed to be. It's a reform of, on its own. Um, again, like I said, if you read the, the, the complete uh, statement on the floor of the house, the Juma inauguration, I said, we're going to do it piecemeal. Uh, to ensure, to make sure it doesn't shock the system, uh, and that's what we're doing. We have another two years to go, and we'll continue to reform the system for the greater good of Nigeria. You think you have met the expectation you set for yourself? Um, we're still. It's two, yes, to to the extent that we're two years down the road. Yes, I, I think we have. Uh, we still have another two years. To uh, the legislative agenda is there. We're going to tick the boxes. We have a contract with Nigerians, which, I, which, which was what we tagged our legislative agenda. For Nigerians to be able to judge us by those things, we have a 10 point agenda. What have we done with those 10 points? The, that legislative agenda is out there in the public. We, we've made a, a song and whatever about it. And um, hopefully, we'll be able to judge by that, not by sentiments, but by facts and achievements. I'm very sure you're familiar with what your critics are saying. The criticism about this Ninth Assembly is the fear uh, that it's going to simply be a rubber, rubber stamp of the executive. Would you say you have disappointed your critics? No, not at all. Um, uh, um, uh, for me, I, I don't know what, what, what they mean by rubber stamp. Um, after, uh, if you mean working harmoniously with another arm of government is rubber stamp, well, so be it. If it's going to work for the country. How has it worked for the country? What they call rubber stamp. Well, first of all, let me, let me, let me, let me um, backtrack a little bit. When you talk about a rubber stamp, how do you call an assembly a rubber stamp, using your words, uh, when all the 80% of the resolutions of the motions that have come up on the floor of that house are almost to check and criticize certain moves of government. They will never see the light of it. They'll never come up on the floor if that, if that house was a rubber stamp house. How do you, how do you label uh, a house that has come up with 96 resolutions on security a rubber stamp? How do you look at the investigations we've done in the last two years? I mean, you would think it was a house of opposition, but, uh, but, 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 but luckily and good enough, that those in the executive understand and allow us to play our role in constitutional role for checks and balances. And that's what we've been doing. We've been doing. Um, it, it just requires proper research uh, before people jump into conclusions and just piggyback on what is, uh, is, uh, is, is common, not common lingo, rubber stamp. Just do the research. Look at the, look at the debates on the floor. Look at the, 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 the motions that have come up on the floor. Look at the bills. Look at the, uh, 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 how we scrutinize the budget uh, even before passage. So that is on one side. That is almost um, uh, it's ironic that a house like that would be called a rubber stamp house. But on the other side, on the, the flip side of it, what have we achieved? Uh, in our role, even if you want to say rubber stamp, we've, we've achieved the general January to December budget cycle, which a lot of people don't understand the, 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 the importance of returning the country to, to, to January, December. If, now, if, if rubber stamping is going, to, is going to give me a January to December budget cycle, which allows investors, allows Nigerians to plan, allows 100% practically implementation of capital budget, which we've seen in the last two years. Prior to that, it was 30%. Prior to that, government was moving, was, was going round and round in uh, all, all, all motion and no movement. When you had this kind of um, uh, schism between the legislature and the executive. And so if, 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 if a January to December cycle, if I can achieve that and, I'm, and be called rubber stamp, all well and good. If I can achieve the PIB that has eluded us for 20 years, albeit whatever criticism, I'm sure we'll come to that. If I can achieve that, and they want to call that rubber stamp, 
I, it's, a, it's a badge I'll wear with honor. If I can achieve uh, electoral amendment, albeit perhaps for some people, certain imperfections here and there, fantastic for me if I'm going to be called a lawyer, if the National if the Assembly is going to call a rubber stamp. If it can achieve, and it goes on and on and on and on, and on. the offshore dichotomy where Nigeria was being cheated, uh, more or less by, uh, by, 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 by um, IOCs over the years, if the Ninth Assembly can achieve that and be called a rubber stamp at the same time, well, so be it. And the list goes on and on and on and on. So an, an, objective, an objective observer who has done his homework and compared the sev several assemblies before now and what has been achieved would not say that. And perhaps uh, uh, one will, I mean, the depth of the matter matters a lot. And optics also are very important in all of this because this is governance. And what worries some Nigerians, for example, is the trend of the borrowings. And the question is uh, whether or not the Ninth Assembly just takes whatever the executive gives it and give them back to. And uh, for example, the federal government, uh, each time they approach you to approve borrowing, and now Nigeria sits on a budget deficit of about 5 trillion naira. Is that not a worrisome for this Ninth Assembly? Well, well to, that, to, to, to an extent, yes, it is. But at the same time, you know, you have to work within, uh, you have to contextualize it. Uh, first of all, when they say each time the executive comes to the National Assembly uh, for, borrow, for borrowing, um, each time is just more or less one time, unless there are exigencies uh, that require such borrowing. Now, the borrowings are already embedded in the MTEF, that is in the budget, the medium term expenditure for framework which the National Assembly passes. Now, you don't pass the MTEF, and we don't pass the MTEF, until after vigorous uh, interrogatories uh, between the executive, the Ministry of Finance, our Committee on Finance, and the House uh, as a whole. So, you see, the, the, the budget of, uh, of a country is predicated on the MTEF. The MTEF contains the borrowing, the deficit, and what is required. Do countries have deficits? Of course they do. That's the only way you run a country. Um, I may be wrong, but I don't know of, 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 of that many, if any, country uh, that is in the blue as opposed to uh, the red. Um, the reason is not far-fetched. Uh, you, you have to borrow to be able to develop your, uh, your country and even your economy. The largest, for me, I probably will say the largest debtor nation in the world is the United States. You're talking about uh, Nigeria owing $57 billion in terms of debt, which is absolutely, you know, it's, it's alarming, it's, it's, it's a lot. But you, you look at the, current, the, the United States that we all try to draw a comparison with, they, they, they owe about, about 33 trillion naira, about 30 trillion dollars, I'm sorry, dollars. And they increased it, it was about two dollars, a year ago it was uh, 28 trillion dollars. Now it's about 30 trillion dollars, and it's about two dollars increase in, in, in one year. But that is not to try to draw a parallel. It's just by way of example to say debt in and of itself shouldn't be a problem. Um, and, and particularly in the last two years. In the last two years where in, um, uh, we've had this advent of COVID, which was unexpected, which came at us from nowhere, uh, which has made revenue very slim. It's made it difficult for us to earn what Nigeria used to earn. So, the, so, so you have a choice. Is that, is that you remain st stagnant in terms of development, or you go up borrowing? What, what matters, what is important is how do you apply the monies borrowed? Do you apply the monies borrowed to, for productivity or, or, for some, or for something else, uh, which was where the National Assembly comes in to, to track, to follow the money, uh, to oversight, and make sure that the monies are applied to uh, productive, and, and, um, and I make bold to say that this government, in terms of infrastructure, has done more than any government in Nigerian history, and the facts are there. Uh, for, it's important to make this point. The facts are there uh, for anybody to, 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 to challenge. Uh, and that's what the money the monies are used for. The SIP program, uh, social investment program, never been done in the history of Nigeria. Uh, are, are we there yet? Have we done enough? The answer is categorical, no. 
um, Rome was not built in a day. You don't, uh, no, no government uh, uh, would, would, ex, would reach, and that's why the Constitution itself, in its thinking and the framers of the Constitution worldwide, allow for a certain number of terms, eight years that is, uh, for, for, for a government to perform, because it believes that in eight years you should. Uh, that's what you need minimum to, to achieve results. And don't forget where we're coming from. So it might even be more than eight years in this case. Otherwise, the Constitution would have said four years should be enough for transformation. Uh, but we're working there. We're working towards it. We're not there yet. I'll be the first to admit we're not there yet. It just requires patience. It requires commitment. It requires sacrifice on everybody's part. Everybody, bar none, government, out of government. Uh, so th that's the way I say it. Uh, I, but, but yeah, I, I, I think we need to... To, to look, uh, that's why I said the issue of the debt profile, we need to look at it within the context of where we find ourselves in Nigeria. At the time when we were, uh, prior to this government, Nigeria was earning about 100 or over $100 per barrel on oil, which is uh, our, our, the mainstay of our economy. You and I know what oil, what is, um, what, is, um, what oil attracts now in terms of finances. Um, so our, our purse is lean. Um, we need to borrow, but we need to borrow reasonably. That's the key. Yeah, because th that's the point when those who say that this Ninth Assembly is a rubber stamp of the executive. And you look at it, and I, the first question is in relation to the debt and the request from the executive arm of government. Because how do you then justify that the budget deficits, which represent about 3.05%, of the estimated GDP is above the 3% threshold that is spelled out in the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Okay, so fine. I mean, that's, a, that's a good question, sure. But if, you, if the, you're, you're saying the threshold is 3%, 3 uh, and you say it's above, now we've got to be very specific on how much above. It shouldn't be above, but by leaving it open-ended, Somebody else could interpret that to me, no, it's 5%, it's 6%. No, maybe the, 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 uh, it, it's, if the threshold is 3%, 3 we're at 3.05. We're at 3.05, so we're a little, bit, a little bit above, and we should try and bring it down. But then what necessitated that uh, uh, going outside um, the threshold? We are in circumstances unprecedented in world history. COVID to the list, the oil glut, COVID. Countries are borrowing because of all over the place because of COVID. So again, the question for me is borrow, but borrow to a productive end, borrow reasonably. What are the terms upon which you're borrowing? What is the moratorium? What is the, uh, the, the interest rate? Um, there's a, I, I, have, I have set up a, what we call COSAP, which is a, a conference of speakers of African parliaments. Uh, we'll be having our first meeting. We've already started talking uh, on issue of debt forgiveness. Uh, um, it's, uh, and we're trying to convince uh, our creditors that it's important um, that it's not about debt relief now, it's about debt forgiveness. Because, because of what has happened with COVID, because of the shock that the economy has received all of them. I'm not talking about Nigeria. It's not peculiar to Nigeria. African countries, African countries especially, um, need to. You, we, we need to work towards debt forgiveness. Otherwise, we're just going to be going around and around. Have you presented for that, that case for, that. for Nigeria? Several people are. Well, most people are going for debt relief. The COSAP. Uh, again, the, the, the Conference of Speakers of African Parliament, which I initiated, we're talking about debt forgiveness, and we started that process. Uh, we'll be having our first conference, um, hopefully, first quarter of next year. Which of these uh, institutions are you hoping might forgive Nigeria for its debts? Well, both multilateral and, and, and bilateral uh, um, uh, lending, institution, lending, is, um, lending institutions, um, both our, our, our bilateral China, and, um, and, uh, and the multilateral, uh, whoever, whoever we owe money, we are approaching. At the end of the day, you ask yourself, with the little that we have, can we move forward as a nation? We, can, we, we don't have to borrow. We don't have to borrow. We can just sit down 
and pay the salaries. Hopefully, there will be enough <laughs> income to at least even pay the salaries. I'm not even sure. But so we have a choice. You either borrow and develop your economy and develop your country, develop the infrastructure, or you sit down, arms akimbo, and say, well, the situation is bad. We're not going to borrow. We don't want to go into debt. You can see it's naked to the it's naked it's it's visible to the naked eyes. You can see the, the the transformation in terms of infrastructure. You can see the trains. You can see that now. Some people may not realize the impact of transport. Transport is perhaps probably the most significant aspect of the country's economy. You have a network of roads like never before. You have a, a, a network of rails like never before and so on and so forth. That's where the money goes to. Do you have the capacity to pay back? Yes, you have the capacity to pay back, but, but you're, 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 you're cutting it. It's, it's, it's very thin right now. And now, well, that's why I agree with you, that we need to check it a little bit, but the criticism should not be that, no, don't borrow. And the criticism is not that you're a rubber stamp because you're approving. And I can, I, I can assure you, there was a time the government brought a, uh, brought um, uh, a request for borrowing uh, about a year ago. But the House resisted it for a long time. We kept it because we wanted to be satisfied. Uh, for months, we refused to pass it because we wanted to be satisfied because a certain part of the country, a certain part of the country had not been taken care of in terms of what we thought, well, you know, because of the situation in Nigeria, they, uh, let's, uh, Let's spread the joy, so to speak, in terms of developing other countries. Uh, uh, and eventually, that matter was re resolved. In March this year, the House of Reps leadership set up a committee for a national security summit. And in July, you submitted a report to the president. You said, uh, when you were presenting that report, that that report has seven recommendations that require legislative action and about 19 that will be implemented by the executive. There are bills that have been introduced in direct response to that, uh, the report of that summit. But how many of those have graduated to a reasonable stage in the National Assembly? Well, thank you for bringing that up. The Security Summit was perhaps first of its kind. Um, like I said earlier, the, um, the, the, the House had passed 96 resolutions in less than two years. 96 resolutions on security. There's no day on that floor that would not come up in scream and argue and debate and talk about security. It's been a, it's been a major focus uh, in the House of Representatives. The House, more than anybody else, called for the exiting of the service chiefs. Uh, we called for the exiting of the service chiefs, uh, which the, eventually was done. Uh, the House, again, when I was talking about reforms, the, the House asked the president to come and explain and talk to us, you know, invariably talking to Nigerians about what's happening with the security situation. Um, but that didn't happen. No, no, it didn't happen. Uh, it, was, it was a reform. As I said, people will, be, will resist reform. Now, it didn't happen not because of the president. The president was absolutely eager, willing, ready, and able was going to come. To come. Yes, he, yeah. he actually even wrote but to... But what happened? You met with that's, him. That's where I'm going. going to come. Yes, he was going. He was, he was going to come. I met with him. He was more than eager. He fixed the date. But everybody has minders. Everybody has advisors. Um, at some point, at some point, it was thought best um, um, to leave it and deal with it in another way. And don't forget that... Um, uh, and I believe, and unfortunately, uh, there, there was word that some people in opposition uh, may have used that as a as as, as, a, as an opportunity um, to score some political political point um, against the president. So we thought it was better um, to deal with it in a different way, which which we did. We got whatever information we needed to get from the president. So there's more than one way to skin a cat. And it is those, that information that we got from the president of the presidency that we acted upon. At the end of the day, the service chiefs were exited. Uh, we did the security, security summit, which, coming back to your question, uh, which was all encompassing stakeholders from everywhere. And the results were that, you know, about eight um, legislative actions and about um, 
18 um, uh, executive actions. We presented the executive um, actions uh, recommendations to Mr. President and to tell you how serious Mr. President is and our concerns about the issue of security. We were, we were meant to present it to him. He had all his service chiefs seated at that. Uh, he, uh, he made a ceremony of it, which was good. He had all the service chiefs in there. We presented it to them. They all have coffees. They're working on it. And you, you and I must say, even in the last few few weeks, there's been a lot of improvement um, uh, in terms of security. It's, the problem is still there. Uh, um, the, but some sto stories have come out in the last couple of weeks about actions that are being taken in the National Assembly, the legislative um, input. We, you talked about the bills, uh, mostly to do with the um, overlapping mandates of the security agencies have already gone through second reading and that's an advanced stage. How many of those bills? Uh, well, I think about um, about eight or nine. About eight or nine. I don't know. I can't give you an exact figure. In right direct now. response to the summit? In direct response to the summit, yes. What about the, uh, the recommendation, the executive recommendation? Well, do, uh, the, the, um, if you recollect, we, we, we presented that to uh, we worked you know, speedily on it and we presented that to the president just before we went on break. Um, I'm sure they're working on it. Are you seeing uh, any any reaction from the executive point? Um, th 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 that's where I'm going. I'm sure, that, like I said, we went on break. We're not even back yet. We're back on Tuesday. And from Tuesday, we will begin to monitor uh, and see how imp implementation of that has gone or is going. You are a leader of the APC. And I'd like to ask you this pointed question. As a representative of the people, your party, the APC, gave you a mandate with a trust that you would deal with security, especially with the pedigree of General Muhammad Buhari. But can you sincerely tell Nigerians today that your party has lived up to the expectations and the trust? First of all, I'll say yes. With the set of and security? That, but the reason why I say yes uh, is simply because I know where we were coming from. And I know the the trajectory and the speed with which we were going so we're coming from a hole a very deep hole that if we had remained maintained the pace of how we we're addressing insecurity at that time i don't know where we'll be today as a nation don't forget that the terrorists said the book Haram had begun to 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 plant their flags in different local governments in this country I don't see it anywhere right now. Where were we? How far deep in the hole were we? And where are we now? We'll say we've made a little bit of progress, but there's a lot more to be done, and that can be done. Uh, I, 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 I would not, I would not score full marks to this uh, to our government on in terms of where we are in terms of security, but I would say that we've moved the needle a little bit. We've moved the little the needle a little bit. Um, we must continue, we must be more aggressive. And like I said, like I said in the last two, three weeks, you know some of the results that, um, and, uh, that have come out. Security has become, it wasn't like that then, it's now hydra-headed. You know, you're talking about bandits, you're talking about Boko Haram terrorists, you're talking about kidnappers, you're talking about headsmen. So it's not, you know, then they were tackling just one, 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 one issue, and it was still bad then. Uh, now, like I said, it's hydra-headed. A lot needs to be done. Uh, a lot must be done. We don't. We we are, we are not. Uh, we don't shy away from that fact. It's a bad situation answer. where we are. Yes, it's children, our kids are being kidnapped from schools. Absolutely. Schools are being shot in less. I mean, not in less than five states of Nigeria. Roads and federal highways are being shot. You can't even ply with rest of mine on the Abuja Kaduna Expressway. These are major cities in the country. Things yeah. are bad. Something needs to be done. Something radical needs to be done. I'll be the first to, to, to admit to that. Um, and that's why we had the security summit. We're pushing. That's why we believe some of the things that we've decided to do, uh, thinking outside the box, making recommendations, that's how, why we think those things will work to an extent. And we hope, and we hope these, things, these things work the way we want them to work. Uh, but security is about everybody. Uh, it's the it's a it's, it's a basis upon which you build anything, and if we get that wrong, then it's going to be difficult to get your economy right. It's right. going to be difficult to get anything right. So for me, it's um, it's, it's 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 fundamental. It's let, fundamental. let me take you to a terrain that you you're fa very familiar with. You're familiar with the governance structure in the United States. You school there, you work there, so you understand. Every year, at least, 
the President of the United States speaks to the people of the United States at the State, State of the Nation address, speaks to the Parliament, mm -hmm. speak, cabinet members are there. Mm -hmm. Do you think that at this stage that we are in the country, there should be a kind of the State of the Nation address where the President and the Chief Executive of the country comes into Parliament and meets the representatives of the people and address the situation of the country? Do you think so? I, I totally agree with you. I pushed for it even when I was um, when I was um, leader of the opposition. Um, I, I, I think that that would um, that would go a long way. Uh, but let's again um, in drawing parallels. Uh, let's understand the systems are different. Uh, the state of the nation is something that is baked into the more or less baked into the, the U.S. Constitution in terms of tradition. It's, it's not written explicitly, but it's almost implied. And that's why it's, it's, over, it's a tradition of, of the 100 years or more. I don't know, I don't know how long, but it's, it's been there forever. Um, um, uh, um, you, you may, some may argue that um, our budget, the president's budget presentation once a year uh, affords an opportunity, is, our, is akin to the State of the Union uh, in America. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't think. I may be wrong. I don't think um, the, the the president goes goes to Congress in the United States to present his budget. I think it's transmitted. Uh, uh, no, I don't quote me on that. But so uh, that may be our own uh, an opportunity, which he does, which every president has used in the past when he presents the budget in front of the whole world, in front of the Congress, um, uh, the Parliament, uh, to address the state of. Uh, the union, but do we need something beyond that? I, I would say yes. I would definitely say yes to that. Uh, that's, that's a yes for me. Do you think this government is communicating to the people enough? <sighs> well, people have different styles. People have different approaches. Um, uh, uh, communication, um, the president has appointed somebody to communicate, but sometimes there's something you know, psychological in, in, in a president, a president, addressing the people personally um, but also you want to even in the United States that you just talked about the state of the union is once a year when there's a crisis I yes maybe a president should but when they, when you want is when you're a situation where a president addresses every uh, so often uh, it may lose its even its bite and it's when the president comes out to address you you must know that it's a major crisis and you must be ready to listen to his hang on his every word um, and that's the essence of addressing addressing the nation and i think we may uh, uh, that that should be that should be uh, communication is key in every relationship in life in marriages in homes between children in businesses communication is key um, i don't think anybody will argue with you about that one let me take you to a rather very touchy issue on the floor of the House of Representatives, the issue of the PIB. The opposition in the House were very agitated. They feel they were so changed uh, by the eventual outcome of the bill. And uh, I mean, they, they, they feel some of them that I spoke with felt, felt more like it was a hatching of uh, the ruling APC's agenda uh, rather than meeting the yearnings of Nigerians. Well, I, I think there's um, a lot of misconception about the PIB. Um, um, yes, the opposition, um, and when we talk about the PIB, they were, they were mostly concerned about just one provision, one provision out of um, 400 provisions in the PIB. Now, let's, uh, we cannot use um, one provision to discredit a whole uh, 400 section uh, 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 law. That, that, that took 20 years in passing. And I think part of the criticism of the PIB by the opposition was just to discredit something that some people were unable to do for 20 years. Now, there was a lot of misconception. We're talking about the 3%, 5% uh, dichotomy. That's what you're talking about. Well, laws are meant are there. Laws are not static. You don't throw away the baby with the bathwater. If the opposition felt aggrieved, uh, which they have a right to, um, that law can be amended at any point in time if you are able to convince people that no, this is what it's supposed to be. The house, if you remember, passed past five percent for for the oil producing areas, and the Senate passed three percent. That by process will go to harmonisation. At the end of the day, 
the three percent carried the day. Um, the house had done its own, and um, the rest was uh, proced procedural. Um, uh, but what I want to say at this point on the PIB is Nigerians again. I, I've always said that research, research, research. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't circumvent the process. Research. Um, PIB has been long. It's probably everybody agrees that it's the, we needed a, we needed the PIB. They agreed twenty years ago, and they've been asking for it, asking for it, asking for it. Now a landmark piece of legislation, PIB. Now PIA was passed by by this government and this Ninth Assembly. Now it's almost natural. That's the way I look at it. But, but unfortunate, natural but unfortunate, that some people would want to use the fact that an achievement was made by this government to discredit that achievement. I'll give you a good example because you brought in the United States at one time, uh, at one point during this interview as an example. Um, even in advanced democracies, you see that happen. The healthcare bill, Obamacare as they know it, was a long, was long time coming. No, the United States could not get the healthcare reform right. The Republicans could not. And then Obama came and the Democrats did it. Till today, that piece of legislation, which is landmark in the United States, suffers a lot of criticism from the opposition. But meanwhile, it benefits the generality of the public. So sometimes uh, politics will always come to play, will always come to bear. The PIB has come, it's a landmark achievement. It inures to the benefit of Nigerians. They leave one or two pieces. It's not a perfect, there's no perfect document. One or two pieces of um, uh, areas that people might disagree with can come up again for amendment and it will come up with subjected to debate. The public will have an opportunity to, to weigh in on the debate. And if it needs amendment, it will be amended. But to say that, um, uh, to take away from the PI, PI, PIB or now PIA um, is a little bit um, because of one provision, which albeit a very important provision, um, is a bit ingenious, a bit ingenious. So you no, disingenuous, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, so your colleagues who are criticizing it, that's what you tell them? No, 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 no. My colleagues will talk. That's not what I tell but them. But they are the ones who are, who are airing these views. Yeah. And they feel bad about it. They're playing. That their positions have not been, they were not, were not catered for. You see, that it does look like the agenda of the ruling agency. Let me, let me put it this way. When you talk about my colleagues who were criticizing it, the way the house is structured now, and that's just the reality of it, 90% of the opposition comes from a particular sector, a uh, particular part of my, a particular part of Nigeria, and they are the oil producing part of Nigeria. You cannot blame them. What they are doing is representing the interest of their people. They're doing the right thing. They are doing the right thing by opposing, the, the, by demanding 5% as opposed to 3%. Otherwise, it will be malpractice on their part if they did not raise a voice of opposition. Uh, uh, you, you grab whatever you can get. You know, there's 3% and there's 5%. If I was from that part of the country or that region that I was producing, I will ask for the 5%. But then again, that is because there might be some also misunderstanding. So I, I, I don't, no, 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 I, I don't blame my, 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 my colleagues. Um, they did exactly what they're supposed to do as, a, as opposition. That was not the only thing that got your colleagues angry. The issue of the Electoral Act Amendment, in fact, got them more infuriated. Mm -hmm. Some of them bust out of the national, on the plenary, mm -hmm. and were protesting the position. Uh, it caused a lot of opera. In fact, uh, the presiding officer of the day could not even control the situation. You had to re, uh, reconvene the following day. So for someone who has been in the, uh, in the National Assembly for these years and the reaction of your, of your colleagues to the uh, electorate am amendment, how do you feel as a presiding officer, as the number one man above I me? Mean, of course, he's uh, one, one above, I mean, amongst equals, but the issue is that your colleagues were not happy with those two major pieces of legislation, the Electoral Act Amendment Bill. They don't think that it represents their, 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 their will and their stance. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I don't feel, I feel, I feel that's democracy at work. And, and I don't know of any assembly, uh, whether in Nigeria or outside of Nigeria, that you don't have situations or issues that will come up and there will be divergent views. 
I mean, you, you cannot all be on the same page at the same time, particularly in a country like Nigeria, where we're so diverse in terms of uh, our ethnicity, our culture, and um, our interests. There's, there's, there's no country like that in the world you wouldn't have any such. Uh, so to expect anything short of that, uh, particularly on two key uh, uh, pieces of legislation, will we'll be asking for, uh, will be unrealistic. But sitting in that chair that day, how did you feel? when you saw the opera? Um, again, I felt, you know, those who were clamoring for a particular provision had every reason to clamor for what they were uh, 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 clamoring for. And those who were against had every reason to... Uh, so it's about consensus building. I'm, I was talking about your own personal feeling that day when the center could not hold and your colleagues went into the deep of the of the chamber and things were out of hand. How did you feel? Well, I felt, oh, well, after two years, it's about time. It's about time. You saw it's coming. After two years, it's about time that we, we, we had a bit of, uh, a bit of activity uh, in, the, in the national. We've had, we've, like I said at the beginning of this interview, we had such an, a harmonious relationship that the lines between uh, the parties were a little bit blurred. And so it's time to, 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 for us to all remember that, you know, there are different parties and different interests. The bottom line, the important thing is that let's all come together, build consensus at the end of the day, and put the national interest as a prime, uh, prime, prime, um, prime interest. And that's, and that's what we did. If you're talking about the electoral, um, electoral, uh, electoral bill, um, what the House did was to maintain status quo in terms of what was brought to the floor of the House by the committee to maintain what even the CSOs, uh, civil society, and the outside world wanted, and which was what? Allow INEC to determine whether or not they have the capacity and capability to, 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 to transmit... Um, to transmit um, results electronically. I think that was the main sticking provision. Again, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a law, there's almost you know, hundreds of um, sections. Uh, so we've allowed that, and we will go to, you know, you understand the procedure more than anybody else, we will go to harmonization because the version passed by the Senate is different. There will be a committee set up by both the House and the Senate. They'll look at the two differences, and they'll come up with, with um, with an agreement on which one to go with. Um, I think we'll do that, you know, when we, when we resume. You think the president will sign it? Well, the president is for, is for, is for, um, is for uh, electoral reform. He said it before he became president, and, he'll sign, and he said it because he wants to leave a legacy. He will, he will sign, and if he doesn't sign, it will be for good cogent reason, which we'll look at. The president is not just going to sign for not signing sake. Because he's turned it down before. Yeah, for good so, reason, for very good reason, and and we have tried to address those reasons. And that, you know, you look, you try to perfect a law as best as you can. The, that's why in the constitution it's embedded that the, a president has a right to veto a bill. It's in American constitution, it's in Nigerian constitution, it's in almost every constitution you can think of. Otherwise, if the president does not have a right to to to, to veto a bill, it wouldn't be there. So the president reserves the right to say, I'm not signing this bill because I don't think you've averted your mind to such and such and such a thing. Lawmaking is about, the, in fact, it's about three arms of government. I was going to say two, the legislative, the legislative and the executive. I'll, I'll even say, I'll go as far as saying three, because at the end of the day, the judiciary will interpret that law as the way they want to interpret it. So it involves three arms of government, and that's the president's role, is to either veto or to sign. And we'll, if he, I believe he will sign, but then again, if he doesn't, he will give reasons for not signing and will address those reasons. But if he doesn't sign for someone who says he wants to leave a good legacy of good elections in Nigeria, would you be disappointed? No, depending on the reason he gives. And look, but how can I, he leave a legacy when he refuses to sign a bill? Well, if he refuses, refuses to sign, when you refuse to sign a bill, it's better you don't sign a bill that has fundamental, you, you're trying to address a problem and then you create even more serious problems. You're better off, you don't sign for the sake of signing because you want to leave a legacy. The legacy you want to leave has to be enduring. 
So if it doesn't sign, it'll be because this is not going to leave an enduring legacy. Go and fix this. And we'll look at it. We'll look at what he says and we'll determine whether it's right or wrong. Well, that's a procedure, considering our procedure. If, if, they, if the National Assembly still disagrees, then you can override the veto. The, the veto. Um, and, if we, and if we agree with him, how long does it take to correct it? We'll send it right back after correction. Let me take you out of uh, the chambers now and take you into the, into the pool of mainstream politics. You visited the APC leader, Bola Metinubu, in London. Some of his supporters believe that um, He's the best man for the presidency of Nigeria in 2023. Do you hold that view too? That he's the best man? Yes. That's what the supporters of Bola Tinubu But first of all, let us be clear on one thing. Um, Ashwaji Bola Tinubu has not declared, uh, either in private or public, at least not in public, to anyone that he wants to run for the president of Nigeria. Now, should and when he decides to, if he decides to um, 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 declare his interest. You and I both know that he more than, more than qualifies to run for the office of the president. But let's get the privilege of the fact that we're speaking with you now and your closeness to Bola Tinubu. Has he told you that he would like to run for president in 2023? I sure you bother I met Tinubu's communication with me is privileged. He has not told you. It's privileged. You don't think he will run? The communication between myself and I sure you bother I met Tinubu is privileged. For someone who has been in the National Assembly for over a decade, uh, with a very complicated nature of our politics, what, in your view, do you think should be con strongly considered in determining who becomes the next president of Nigeria? Capacity, 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 and love of country. You don't think that rotation should be considered too? Um, under the circumstances, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a wild question, but under the, under the circumstances we find ourselves as, in Nigeria uh, uh, as a multi-ethnic uh, society, yes, for now I think the rotation still um, uh, um, should be considered. It may not be the ultimate, but it should be part of uh, um, uh, uh, what, what is considered. Uh, but I, I, I think Nigerians also, by and large, uh, want fairness. Maybe that's where rotation comes in. But they also want capacity. So, the, so there, 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 there's a balance, yes. You think an Igbo president in 2023 would douse the tension in the Southeast region? Your question, in the Southeast region, clearly. Will it douse the tension in the southeast? I mean, clearly. Do you think the a southwest, southwest, a southwest, a southwest uh, president would douse this tension in the southwest? A northern president would douse the tension in the north. So your question, really, again, goes to, 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 to nothing. If he, is a south-south president, whether fair or not, would douse the tension in the south-south. Because, I mean, there is a political arrangement which you politicians discuss in your inner circles where to go, who to give, who to be, and who not to be. And the question is that when the Igbos feel that they have been left out out of the scheme of things for these years, and uh, rightfully, and they think that the rotation should sit directly in their region, and that's why I'm asking, you are in the National Assembly where the polarity of our politics take preeminence, so that's why I'm asking the question, do you think that Igbo presidency in 2023, we try as much as possible to dial some tension in the country. Yeah, equity and fairness should be a consideration. And it will, it will, it, 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 to an extent, it will dial uh, uh, dial, dial some tension. But the question is that, is that all there is um, to the presidency of Nigeria? But yes, equity and fairness is very important. After President Buhari's eight years in 2023, what does the fortune of APC look like? Considering those who believe after Buhari's tenure, APC might fall apart like a pack of cards. You, you, you ever heard this um, two words, wishful thinking? That's exactly what you just said, right? wishful thinking. There's no question that um, President Buhari comes with massive goodwill. Massive. Um, his 12 million votes that people talk about is not folktale. Clearly, 
it's been proven over and over again. So, politics sometimes is about personality. So there's no question. Perhaps his 12 million will reduce to 10 because he's not running. Not because he's unpopular, not because those 12 million people have turned away from him, but because he's not running. So it might be a personality thing. But I find solace in the fact that his personality would also assist, even outside of government, in helping mobilize, he's a great mobilizer, people to the APC, one. Two, I believe that Mr. President um, has left enduring footprints, maybe not to everybody, opposition will always be opposition, enduring footprints, footprints to a good majority of people um, that will also translate to the APC fortunes. Three, the policies that the president has on ground. Like I said earlier, four years may not be enough to accomplish, eight years may not be enough to accomplish those policies, but there will be a continuum. And somebody who would pursue and have the vision of Mr. President uh, would also be there to rally the base, which is what he has. He has a base. And it's all about it, politics all over the world. Even in the most advanced democracies, it's about rallying your, brave, your base. You, you think your party, APC, still has that steam and the good way that it eroded it into office in 2015? So, let me say this. Again, I look at politics from the, uh, the monocle, the, the, the perspective, uh, for, from an international perspective, anywhere in the world. When you're in, pos in opposition, you have a stronger voice. Uh, whether the party still has enough following to, to win the next election, I, I personally, and without any doubt in my mind, believe so. That Nigerians will still support your party? I believe so. You know, there's a, there's a lot of noise out there, a lot of smokes and mirrors, you know, out there. Um, and well-founded. Some of them are very well-founded. But by the time it comes down to it, by the time we be, everybody begins to release, uh, this is what we've done in the last uh, whatever years, uh, this is what we've done, this is what we've done. I think Nigerians will begin to peel away and uh, look through those smokes and mirrors and begin to look at the real issues. Where we're coming from, and where we are now, um, there's still a lot to be done. There's a lot of dis dissatisfaction. I totally agree with that. There's a lot of dissatisfaction. But the question is that what do Nigerians have? And look, let's look at the opposition party. I don't want to talk politics here because uh, I don't talk serious issues. Um, well, but the question is that um, uh, what's going on on the other side of the aisle? What is going on? You know, there's a lot of disarray. People look at APC because APC is the ruling party. So you're the people, you're the ones that people will look at. But in terms of, if you want to look at all a, a holistic picture, I, 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 I think the APC still stands a very good chance uh, and will do well in the next election. And if you want to dissect it state by state, you can't come to any other result but that. All right, let's, let's bring it home. Speaker, Honorable Femba Yabiamila, tell me, what's your plan after your time as Speaker of the House of Representatives? You planning to become Governor of Lagos? You know, I, I'll, yeah, that, that provoked a smile. Um, um, no, I don't have any such plans. I have no immediate plans. I have a job that I'm doing right now. It's a very tough job. Very, very tough. Sometimes the most difficult job I say to people in the world. Um, and people don't understand it, but I'm not, this is not a forum where I'm going to break it down. So uh, I don't want distractions. I, uh, uh, I'm working as a speaker of the House of Representatives with a lot of responsibilities on my shoulders right now. Any other thing would be a distraction. As for Lagos State Governorship, not even thought about it. It's why? No, and why? The, pre the, the present governor of Lagos State is doing a good job. Why? Well, to, well, the, the fact that uh, we had a one-time governor uh, at one time doesn't mean it's going to be the same uh, um, forever. The president is doing that. The, the, the governor is doing a good job. Under the circumstances, he's had difficult times uh, in these last two years. 
and he's come out, um, I think, um, uh, well. And so, I, for me, why upset the Apple card? I think he's doing a good job. Uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what the future portends for everybody. Uh, we, we can't sit here today and predict tomorrow. Not even in the future, do you think you can be governor of Lagos? The future is, is, is what it is. The future, you know, you leave all those things in the hands of, uh, of the person that decides the future for everybody. On a final note, uh, um, in your time in being a lawmaker and in being in politics, what would you like to be remembered for? <sighs> ah. What would I like to be remembered for? Um, I'd like to be remembered as a legislator who came, rose through the ranks, made history as the first minority leader, opposition leader, as the first legislator to occupy the position of minority leader, leader of the house and speaker, and did something with it. And worked uh, assiduously to make Nigeria a better place. The work of the legislator is ex extremely difficult but then, not me, I don't, me as a person, but the Ninth Assembly. I want the Ninth Assembly to be remembered for a house that came and saw, and if you like, conquered. Honorable Speaker, Honorable Femi Bajabi Amila, it's a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, sir.